thank you everyone for coming. Uh, first of all, I'm very sorry that my voice is a bit hoarse. It's because that I haven't slept for the I haven't slept well for the past couple of weeks because the price of Bitcoin is <laughs> down quite a lot, which I can't understand because um, I bought it using technical analysis, and they say that the price of Bitcoin is on the neck of the Stegosaurus and it should be going up, but it's not, it's actually going down. So uh, my name is Oscar Shabana and I'm from Indonesia. Um, I'm an MBA at Judge Business School. I've been uh, in the Bitcoin space since 2014. Uh, I have a pilot project on creating uh, remittance services from Hong Kong to Indonesia, which doesn't work not because the technology doesn't work, it's just that the savings at the time for the technology is not big enough to warrant people to change their habit of sending money from Western Union to uh, using other uh, methods. So uh, as I was aware, there's only one person here that is from computer science. Okay, okay. So. Uh, is it safe to say that does any of you know in detail how Bitcoin works, how blockchain, the technology that empowering Bitcoin works? So uh, before we continue, I'm going to say that I'm not going to discuss so many things about Bitcoin. I'm going to discuss the technology behind it. So if you're here because you're interested in Bitcoin, I mean like the door is there. I don't know whether I can make you rich fast or whatever. Okay. So uh, this is uh, usually the, the stuff that I use to explain what is actually a blockchain. Uh, some people call it like a distributed ledger technology. So what it basically is, is that everyone has a notes of what value that they're holding. And that note is hold not just by one party, but hold by everyone. For example, if you're um, saving your money in a bank, the bank has the record. Sometimes you will also be sent a record once every month. But if the, those records that you hold that you, will get, you were sent once every month, if there's a dispute, the bank will just revert back that, you know what, based on our record that we hold, this is actually the true uh, value. So basically in blockchain, what happened is at the start, Andy, Bob, and Hannah, they have the same notes, which indicates what, how, how, many, how many money or how many, uh, what value that they each hold. For example, here, when Andy is sending money to Bob, in Andy's note, he is adding one, Bob also adding one to under Bob's name. At, and, and at the same time, Andy, um, Minus two, uh, minus one in his notes, while also uh, deduct uh, Bob also deduct uh, Andy uh, in his notes by minus one. Once this transaction happens, everyone uh, verify whether Andy is really uh, making that transaction. Bob is checking whether Andy's signature is not forged, and if everything is satisfied, the transaction happens. Also, when Andy is sending money to Hannah, uh, Andy is, uh, in Andy's note, he again deduct his money by minus one. In his note, he plus Hannah's money by plus one. The same happened with Hannah's note. The same also happened with Bob's note. So basically, what distributed ledger means is that everyone holds the record of everybody. So what makes it blockchain? As I mentioned, when uh, the transaction happened, everyone is uh, verifying and recording their transaction in their own notes. So uh, when, when, when you're uh, looking at people that is uh, explaining, oh, Bitcoin or blockchain technology is so awesome, it's gonna be like the second messiah, it's not really that, because basically, is there anything hard about this? Basically, you said that I have a note, you have a note, he has a note, and when the value change, we update all the notes at the same time and we verify. 
that's basically it. Now the verification itself is interesting because basically all of the transaction is going to be aggregated into one block. So one block of data can be consisted by several different, uh, several different transactions from several different people. That's where the block came from because the, the transaction is not done immediately. It's done staggered based on how many, how many transaction is within a block. And the chain itself comes from because this is one block of transaction. And if, let's say, this is one transaction and then another one in another uh, period, Andy is creating a transaction to Hannah, this transaction is then uh, created in another block that is connected with the chain. Okay, so uh, to very oh, okay, so uh, that's basically where the block and the chain come from. The block is the block of their transaction. The chain is uh, between the blocks. It is connected by a chain. Uh, I put a, 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 a lock symbol here is because when this block is going to be uh, verified by a miners in Bitcoin term. So what miners are actually doing is basically they verify all the transaction and then they try to guess a random number in this transaction block. And then when they guess it right, they will have a given hash key. This is important, why? Because if we go back to here, if there's only three parties, it's easy to get the verification. Hannah, Bob, and Andy can just meet and then say that, oh, my nose is right, his nose is right, yours are wrong, so you have to follow our nodes. But if you have so many uh, member, uh, so many uh, actors within that transaction, so you need something that is uh, non-reputable uh, and immutable. Why they are using hash key is because once um, uh, once the miners generate the hash key in this section of the blockchain, for example, if somebody else is changing this transaction here, the hash key here will be different. It's not just going to be slightly different, it's going to be so much different. Uh, I don't, I don't uh, have the example of the hash key here, uh, but in a way, if there is, uh, if the miners already lock the hash rate here and he, he come up with a hash rate, when somebody else is changing the transaction here, this hash rate will be changing. However, it is not supposed to be changing. Why? Because the miners is already verifying uh, the chain over here. So uh, what happened actually when you are sending the Bitcoin uh, for, from your wallet to another wallet, for example? First, you have to have your own wallet. It can be a, a, hand, it can be a mobile phone, it can be a hardware wallet, it can be a website. The point is that the value of the, of the Bitcoin is not in your wallet. It's actually in the blockchain. Your wallet is only reading the data from the blockchain. When you have a wallet, basically you have a key pair. It's called a public and private key. In a way, a public key is, can be considered as uh, your Bitcoin address. When you ask someone to send you money and then you give them an, a Bitcoin address, basically that is your public key that corresponds to private key. Pri uh, in a way, you can think it of um, public key is like a, your home address and private key is actually the card or the keys to open your home address. People can send to any public key, but they cannot uh, change or modify or uh, make an instruction on that public key if they don't have the private key. So if we go back to here is that from the wallet, uh, you send the money to a public key and then the miners are going to be, do the verification whether their transaction is correct. By verification, that this means that the miners are checking first whether you do have that Bitcoin balance and where you have it from. 
if you do have that balance, they will enter. Uh, they will put this into some some sort uh, something that is called mem memory pool, mempool, in which from this mempool they they will uh, do the mining, in which this mining is basically a process of one very uh, verifying the previous transaction, and w in which the miners are going to guess what is actually the nonce. Nonce, in a way, is basically any number between 0 to 2 to the power of 32, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 31, because it's 32 bits. Uh, after the, uh, the successful miners uh, can uh, guess the right nonce, the block is locked, all the value in the transaction is locked, and then put to the next block. This block is then broadcasted to the blockchain. When the blo uh, when the the blockchain uh, sorry when the block is already recorded in the blockchain, the people who is sending and receiving the money then can get the confirmation. In Bitcoin's blockchain, the confirmation is every ten minutes. So every time you make a transaction, the first confirmation, the fastest first confirmation that you will receive is within 10 minutes. So perhaps that is why you can imagine that using Bitcoin in an everyday activities, let's say paying for coffee, for example, now with an NFC chip, you can just like tap it in, within one second, it's already uh, confirmed. But with Bitcoin, both parties have to wait 10 minutes before it can be confirmed. Why 10 minutes? Because basically, this is a uh, hard-coded uh, hard coded block within, the, block, uh, within the, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain system, in which this block can only be made every 10 minutes with the size of one megabyte. Uh, one megabyte in size, I think uh, it's around 7 to 15 transactions. If we're using two key, uh, if we're using two inputs and two outputs, two inputs for uh, where the coin came from and two outputs for where the coin is going to, it's around seven to fifteen transactions per minute. So, uh, as you can see here, that the process of doing a transaction using a Bitcoin's blockchain in this case is highly inefficient, because first the miner needs to do the verification of the transaction, not just one transaction, but every transaction that is happening, and then comparing it to the previous block, and then they have to guess what is actually the, the random numbers uh, that they have to guess to get the correct hash rate so that the chain can be made into a block. And this is a very wasteful uh, solution because that means that everyone that is using Bitcoin must copy the Bitcoin notes, so to speak. If the notes is just between three people with three transactions, it's fine. But if you really want to use, let's say, Bitcoin blockchain as a system that is powering the banking institution, for example, that is handling perhaps 2,000 transactions per, per second, copying the database every time a transaction is happening is just not viable. What if I told you in the current price, the Bitcoin mining consumes electricity more than 133 countries, 139 countries? Do you know how much is Visa using to process 10 million transactions? I'll get to that. So, as you can see here, um, I think it's, it's, it's in December that Bitcoin hype is really huge. People are buying, uh, mortgaging their house, buying Bitcoin in 19,000. The energy consumption index is going through the roof. Currently, Bitcoin uh, mining uh, consume almost 50 terawatt hertz, uh, 50 terawatt hour of energy per year. And if the price of Bitcoin is going up, it's uh, again will go up as more people will try to mine Bitcoin. Because when they do the verification, they get the verification uh, transaction fee. 
and also they get 12.5 Bitcoin every time they successfully guess which nonce, uh, which uh, nonce that is uh, the correct solution for the next hash. We can also see that Bitcoin energy consumption is more than Iraq, more than Hong Kong, and more than Peru. Peru is a country with 100 million people. Uh, it's just slightly below Singapore. Singapore is, I would say, that they're already developing countries. Anyone here ever been in Singapore? You know how Singapore is. Yeah. Every night, everyone is, uh, you know, the buildings are playing with lights. Pretty much like, like Hong Kong, really. So the energy consumption, just to verify that transaction, is huge. To verify one Bitcoin transaction, they are actually using more or less almost 600 kilowatt hours. While for the 100,000 transaction using the, the current visa system, they are using just a bit more than 100 watt hour. So you know why Bitcoin, I would think Bitcoin will not replace the, the global uh, economic banking system just from this fact alone. It's really huge, it's really expensive to process a Bitcoin transaction. Another problem that, uh, that blockchain has is the transaction capacity. Currently, Visa is, uh, is processing around 2,000 transactions per second. PayPal is around 115. PayPal is already considered disruptive back in its days in, uh, in 2000. Bitcoin at the moment can only process around seven transactions per second. Uh, if, they, uh, if they hit their maximum limit, perhaps they can hit 10 transactions per second, but nothing more. So, uh, it goes to show that even though the transaction rate of Bitcoin is increasing, but their capability of doing the transaction does not. Why? Because what I said earlier, that every one block, there is a hard limit that one block can only process one megabyte of transaction. So, if there is more transaction, it's going to be put in the memory pool. If it's going to be put in the memory pool, you are going to wait very long for your transaction to confirm. Now, initially, I said that the Bitcoin confirmation takes around 10 minutes. Well, during the last hype on the right side of the chart, the average confirmation time is around 2,500 minutes. That's almost two days to confirm one transaction. Now imagine if you're a business, you're, you're accepting Bitcoin, and then the price of Bitcoin is going up and down 10% a day, but you cannot really confirm it. It's possible that, let's say, um, your client is, is buying a game at $50, for example. When you settle the transaction, when you confirm the transaction, the price, the value of the money that your client give to you might come down because, hey, uh, in the initial slide, I said that Bitcoin comes down like almost 50% from, from their top in just two, three weeks. So uh, that is actually the problem. Uh, and this problem is not going anywhere. Oops. Another problem is the transaction fees. Now, uh, I mentioned that the miners are the one that is verifying all the transaction. The miners are the one that is using all that power. Of course, the miners are not going to do it for free, right? Mm -hmm. And then I also mentioned that uh, all of the transaction in Bitcoin is going to be put in a block. And it is up to the miners which transaction that they are going to put in the next block that they're working. If you're a miner, which transaction are you going to put? Of course, it's going to be the transaction with the highest transaction fees. That is why another problem is that uh, in end of December, early January, the average transaction cost of doing one transaction of Bitcoin is topping at more than $50. This $50 is not owed. So if I'm transacting one Bitcoin, which is at the time, I think, $15,000, $16,000, uh, my transaction fee is going to be like $50, $50, which is not bad. That's 0.5%-ish, right? But no, it's not the transaction cost per Bitcoin. It's the transaction cost per transaction. That means that if you're buying a coffee for two pounds, 
then you're going to pay around 40 pounds for the transaction fee if you want your confirmation within the next 10 minutes. I don't know any, any sane person is going to use to make blockchain, uh, Bitcoin's blockchain as the global driver of the world's financial institution. So my question is, can blockchain be all and all? If that's the case, actually, the relational database system of the bank is a more sane option. Yes, it's centralized. Yes, sometimes it can be hacked, but so does you know, blockchain. The Ethereum, uh, Ethereum chain with their uh, DAO of a couple of years ago was hacked and they was forced to roll back the transaction so that the hacked transaction does not go through. So in a sane world, nobody actually is using Bitcoin for a serious transaction. And th this is actually one of the key takeaways from the previous Davos meeting uh, last month, in which uh, many big banks, many central banks, they, they sometimes appear to be against blockchain and Bitcoin in general. But one of the ex-central bank of Mexico said that uh, basically we have tried to explore the use of blockchain within the banking sector. And we think that it's seriously not, not much better than uh, the system that we're having now, just because of that problem that I just uh, explained. Now we're going to the good parts. Um, does anyone here is a math, uh, is in math department? So of course you do know what a directed uh, cyclic graph is, right? So this is basically the, the description that I take from Wikipedia. I'm not really sure why academician really likes to make things verbose. So here's my simple explanation of what directed acyclic graph is. I was going to wrap this, but my voice is a bit hoarse, so I'm just gonna read it for you. Graph is basically nodes connected to another nodes. This nodes connected to other nodes. Directed means that the connection between nodes have a uh, the connection between nodes have a direction, so that the connection from A to B is not the same as B to A. And then acyclic means that is not circular, so that um, when you're going from here to here you can't really go back to here. So in a way, directed acyclic graphs is just dots pointing to another dots. But then they manage to have this kind of description. So how, how does this um, pertaining to uh, our topic today, whether the directed acyclic graph can be an alternative to blockchain? So let's get back to our uh, initial uh, example that we have three people that has three, uh, basically three notes. There's Hannah, Bob, and Andy. This is in a blockchain. But in a DAG, I'm going to give you an illustration. I'm going to reset everyone's uh, value to zero. And let's just say that me is actually the God node, the Genesis node. I'm the one who is holding all the value. And then I'm sending the value to Andy and then Bob. If you compare this kind of uh, notes in the blockchain, everyone has the notes of, uh, everyone has the record of transaction of everyone else. But here, they only have the, uh, the transaction record of themselves. That is actually the beauty of uh, the system is that not everyone is saving everyone's data, which will save the computing power, which will save the storage power, which will also save the, story, uh, the, the bandwidth. So what happened is that when I sent, let's say, uh, five pound to Andy, my ledger, so to speak, is updated by deducting five, and Andy is by plus five. Uh, and then I'm sending two dollars to uh, two pounds to Bob, which Bob is going, which Bob's note is going to increase by two, and my notes is going to deduct by two, because I'm the Genesis node. There is no verification going on. The thing is, when Bob or Andy is making a transaction, this is what happened. <clears throat> 
So we know that Oscar is sending Andy a five pound, and then Andy in this transaction, he's sending Hannah three pounds. So when, they, when Andy is sending the money to Hannah, it is Andy's computer or Andy's note that is doing the verification, whether this transaction or two, or is true or not. He's doing the verification by checking to the previous node whether, hey Oscar, do you really send me five pound? If Oscar said, yes, I do send you five pounds, then Andy uh, can confirm that, yes, I do have five pounds, and then I can send it to Hannah. This is also what happened when Bob sent the money to Hannah, is that Bob uh, uh, is sending one pound to Hannah by checking to Oscar, hey Oscar, are you sending me two pounds? If Oscar say yes, then that means I do have two pounds, and I can send that uh, one pound to Hannah. Does Hannah need to do any more uh, uh, confirmation, computation? No. Hannah will do verification when Hannah is uh, trying to make the transaction. In this way, when Hannah is receiving uh, the value of money or the data or whatever that is going, can be put into the, uh, into the graph, Hannah does not spend any computing power or just minimal computing power. So does when Hannah is sending money back to Oscar, let's say she's sending two pounds back to Oscar, uh, in Oscar note, the pound should be plus two. In Hannah, the pound should be minus two. Hannah is checking to her previous transaction that is sending the money to her wallet. Hey, are you sending me money? How much are you sending me money? What is your, uh, what is your public key? Uh, and whether the public key can be verified by Andy's private key. And that is how it is. So uh, in, in a grand scheme of things, if we go back to a uh, directed acyclic graph, it's like this. This is the end transaction. The transaction starts from here. This is the genesis transaction. In the previous, in the previous example, this is Oscar. And this is Hannah. Basically, when Hannah wants to make a new transaction, he checks back to the previous node. Hey, we have a previous transaction. I want to confirm it now. So does when this node wants to make a transaction to this node, sorry, so it's, it's better to be explained this way. When this node wants to make a transaction to this two nodes, this node will have to verify whether the transaction in this two previous node is correct. This is not where the money goes to. This is actually where does the transaction should verify to. The money is going from left to right, but the verification is going from right to left. The verification is going from the outmost ending node to the previous node and only to the previous node. So, you know, when the, transa uh, when the transaction is here, that does mean that this one is going to do the verification all the way to the genesis block. Because if it does, then it's no different than blockchain that is doing the verification to the, the previous block with, with, with the hash rate. So let's say, for example, this node wants to send the money to this node. He is doing checking the transaction to two previous nodes that is sending money to this node. And then, when this node is sending money to this node, for example, so, sorry, uh, sorry, yeah, this node is sending money to this node, he's checking uh, verification to this node. And then when this node wants to send money to this node, he is making the confirmation to the previous node that is making the, tra uh, that is sending the money to that node. And so does, if this node wants to make another transaction, it verifies uh, the, uh, from the previous transaction whether uh, the public key and the private key pair is correct. And that is how you get verification. It's quite different than the verification in the blockchain in which you have to do the verification to the Genesis block. Of course, is there any uh, weakness to this? Uh, in blockchain, the verification is done, in Bitcoin specifically, the verification is done by a specialized hardware. It was previously in 2009 
can be done with, a, with a, your own CPU. And then when more serious people enter, uh, then it's not worth it to do it with a CPU because it doesn't have enough computing power. People are, are doing it with a GPU, with a graphic card, because it can calculate uh, millions of hash per second, millions of hash combination per second. But then when more serious player enter the market because Bitcoin prices keep going up, people are creating uh, a specialized processor called ASIC, ASIC, which can calculate billions of uh, hash transaction per second, which is far, far uh, faster than a GPU. In a way, the blockchain verification is done very expensive. And because it is done with a very specialized hardware, it's relatively harder to attack. It's relatively harder for people to include a, a, a false transaction within the block because basically uh, they have to have uh, the same computing power with the, uh, with the current uh, miner in, uh, that is using ASIC. However, with this, because the computing power basically to process the previous transaction is trivial, you don't really need to have an, uh, a specialized hardware to verify the transaction. It is possible for a dedicated actor who has a specialized hardware to actually corrupt the network, so to speak. So let's say um, he's trying to make a verification here, and then the, the bad actor here is making his own trees or his own branch over here, which will invalidate this verification. That is actually why uh, in this DAG, it's usually, uh, it's, uh, it's usual for a DAG, uh, uh, for a cryptocurrency that is using directed acyclic graph to make a verification not just with one node, but at least with two nodes or more so, so, uh, to prevent any nefarious actors to, uh, to actually uh, try to exploit that you don't really need too much computing power to do this. So here's one example of cryptocurrency that is using DAG. Uh, the purple one is actually the confirmed transaction. As you can see, when, uh, when the network is healthy, when everyone wants to make a new transaction, he tries to connect with the previous node and confirm whether the transaction is correct or not. Currently, the, uh, the, the cryptocurrency that is using directed acyclic graph methodology uh, 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 sorry, C currently the cryptocurrency that is using the direct acyclic graph technology is a uh, three cryptocurrency. It's IOTA, uh, DAGCoin, Digibyte, and Byteball, if I'm not mistaken. And those perhaps is not really that much of a household name unlike Bitcoin. So the benefit of DAG is that it is asynchronous because if, you, if we go back to here, Oops. This node needs to verify the transaction only when this node wants to make a new transaction. It does not need to verify at a certain point of time. It does, need to, it does not need to, to verify uh, when the neighboring node wants to make a transaction. It only needs to verify to spend the computing power when this node wants to make a transaction. That is why it allows an asynchronous uh, verification, an asynchronous um, verification with the block, which means that directed acyclic graph is actually saving time. So it is possible uh, for the cryptocurrency that is using this uh, type of verification or digital ledger to be able to, let's say, if you want to buy a coffee with a card that is connected with a DAG, the confirmation can be done within seconds, just as if you are using uh, your Barclays NFC or Monzo NFC. The second benefit is that since the verification is not done through all of the network, it's only done through the previous uh, transaction only, the computing power that is needed is quite small. And we are basically not uh, spending uh, or wasting power into just guessing what uh, what uh, next nonce is in the blockchain, which is what happening in Bitcoin. The third benefit is that using the pre uh, using DAG, we don't really need a miner. Uh, if you remember here, 
is that the one that is using it, the one that is doing the verification is actually the one who is doing the transaction. Basically, if you don't do the transaction, you don't need to do the verification, which means that your computing power is going to go to be low, and so does you don't really need a specialized hardware which the miners usually have, so you don't really going to have high cost like Bitcoin. So in essence, you don't have any arbitrary limit. Basically, if you want to do trend, uh, 10 transactions, you can, as long as you do uh, the verification of the previous transaction and help the network. You don't really need a uh, high energy consumption because you don't verify all of the transaction. You only verify the transaction that is going to you when you want to make a new transaction. And then you have a fast confirmation time because you don't really need the miners to aggregate all the transaction into one block and then doing it every 10 minutes. You can, you can actually do it every time you want to do the transaction. So I know I look like this when I'm uh, trying to explain the, the, the directed cyclic graph, although I hope I was looking like that. Uh, and I hope that uh, perhaps we can continue to, uh, to the question and answer session if you want to know more about directed acyclic graph. Thank you very much.